often with his relatives. The current debt-ridden society increasingly with his relatives, I mean, more often than the Paris Common. Uh, and as much as that residence and that environment may be provisional, precarious, conditioned by the imminent revolt, until the revolt begins, they are the site of an individual battle, more or less solitary. You can love a city, you can recognize its houses and its streets in your most remote and secret memories. But only in the hour of revolt is the city really felt like a high place and at the same time as your own city. Your own because it belongs to you, but at the same time also to others. Your own because it is a battlefield you and the collectivity have chosen. Your own because it is a circumscribed, and I think it's an important term, circumscribed space in which historical time is suspended and in which every act has its own value in its immediate consequences." End of quote. The collective experience of time and of what Yezi calls symbols, such as the present, uh, when he talks about symbols, it's a situation in which the present adversary simply becomes the enemy, the club that I have in my hand is the weapon, victory is the just act, just act, and so on. This means that the revolt is in a sense a kind of action for action's sake, an end inseparable from its means. Yezi writes, it was a matter of acting once and for all, and the fruit of the action was contained in the action itself. Every decisive choice, every irrevocable action meant being in accordance with time, every hesitation to be out of time. When everything came to an end, some of the two protagonists had left the stage forever. End of quote. Remaining with the interruptive paradigm of an intransitive and intransigent revolt, we can ask whether, or so to what extent, the historical space that revolt intervenes in, even when it interrupts it, in some sense transforms its character. In that sense, I think it's no accident that the kind of sabotage envisioned in the coming insurrection is on lines and nodes of circulation and not on machines and systems of production as such. And that leads me to my second section, the triumph, the triumph of logistics. The centrality to an intensely urbanized capital of the efficient, profitable, ceaseless, standardized movement of material and information, <coughs> the very target of the coming insurrection's ethics of interruption, has been noted for a very long time. <coughs> Fifty years ago, Lewis Mumford, writing in The City and History of the Catastrophic Propensities of the Contemporary Metropolis, what he elegantly called the aimless giantism of the whole, pointed to the pivotal role of the growing possibilities of supply to what he thought were the insensate agglomerations of populations in exponentially expanding cities, and the relations to what he termed the tentacular bureaucracies that controlled such flows of goods. Mumford wrote, during the 19th century, as population heaped further into few great centers, they were forced to rely more fully on distant sources of supply, to widen the basis of supplies and to protect the lifeline that connects the source with the voracious mouth of the metropolis. This became the function of army Navy. Insofar as the metropolis, by fair means or foul, and obviously in Mumford is generally foul, is able to control distant sources of food and raw materials, the growth of the capital, and I suppose the growth of the capital, can proceed in that. End of quote. The organizational and energetic resources required to reproduce the metropolis are formidable. In a nice uh, phrase, Mumford says, like Alice's Red Queen, by great exertion and utmost speed, the metropolis barely manages to remain in the same position. Not only does the metropolis have the intensification and expansion of supply lines as precondition, logistics also becomes its primary concern, and indeed its foremost product, as well as the character of its power. As Mumford noted, the metropolis is in fact a processing center in which a vast variety of goods, materials, and spiritual, material and spiritual is mechanically sorted and reduced to a limited number of standardized articles, uniformly packaged and distributed through control channels to their destination, bearing the approved metropolitan label. Processing has now become the chief form of metropolitan <coughs> control. Despite his systemic objection to the catastrophic ends of this amorphous machine for capital accumulation, Mumford also thinks of these control capabilities, and this is what I wanted to dwell on, as potentially reconfigurable or refunctionable in a multi-centered, um, and in his view, though perhaps or certainly not my organic society, a question to which I'll return. But it's also worth noting that, especially in terms of the informational requirements attendant to such control by processing, Mumford too is tempted in thinking how the city could be transformed, tempted by the possibilities of insurgent interruption. At one point, in fact, when he's talking about the tentacular bureaucracy, he mentions uh, with a certain, uh, uh, you know, 
obviously a certain uh, attraction to its charm, the famous anarchist slogan, incinerate the documents. neutralize the servers or whatever you want to call it. Uh, to stress the ease with which such a system, such a metropolitan system, founded on the circulation of real or virtual paper, could be ground to a halt. Now possibly the most illuminating analysis of the politics and economy of logistics, I think has been forwarded by the labor theorist and historian Sergio Bologna, an animator in the 1970s, with the rather brilliant journal Clima Maggio, which carried out seminal inquiries into containerization and the struggles of port workers in the 1970s. Incidentally, Klingo Maggio is also a very interesting source <coughs> for an attempt to bridge the histories of uh, socialist, anarchist, and communist ones of the workers' movement. Countering those post-workerists, or so-called post-workerists, it's a bit of a dog's dinner as a term, but nevertheless, uh, who have equated post-forwardism with the rise of cognitive and immaterial, uh, of the cognitive and immaterial, and basically with the ubiquity of a figure of work patently traced on those of the academic or cultural worker, Bologna notes that the key networks that condition contemporary capitalism are neither effective nor simply digital, but involve the massive expansion and constant innovation in the very material domain of logistics. And in particular, of what he calls, and he knows this well because actually, after having been more or less expelled from the Italian university system, he makes his money as a logistics uh, analyst. In particular, of supply chain management, conceived in terms of the speed, flexibility, control, capillary character, and global coverage of stocking, transport, circulation services and commodities. Bologna underscores the military origins of logistics, namely in the work of De Jomine, a Swiss military theoretician working first under Napoleon and then, when Napoleon didn't do so well, under the Tsar. The, the original function of logistics, right Bologna, commenting on De Jomine, was to organize the supplying of troops in movement through a hostile territory. Logistics is not sedentary, this is, is the art of optimizing flows. So logistics must not only be able to know how to make food, medicines, weapons, materials, fuel, and correspondence reach an army in movement, but it must also know where to stock them, in what quantities, where to distribute the storage sites, how to evacuate them when needed. It must know how to transport all of this stuff, and in what quantity, so that it is sufficient to, set, to satisfy the requirements, but not so much as to weigh down the movement of troops, and it must know how to do this for land, sea, and air forces. Bologna goes on to analyze how the problems of logistics have been central to the ongoing transformations of contemporary capitalism, from the just-in-time organization of production of so-called Toyotism to the world-transforming effects of containerization, which itself was famously accelerated by the military logistic use of containers in the Vietnam War. The homogenization registered at a kind of existential and political level in the coming insurrection is here given a very prosaic a momentous form in the standardization and modularization that characterizes this kind of planetary logistics, which, in order to maintain the smoothness and flexibility of flows, must abstract out any differences that will lead to excessive friction and inertia. For my purposes, however, what is crucial is what this logistical view of post-Fordism tells us about the character of antagonism, and specifically of class struggle. Narcissistically mesmerized by hackers, interns, and precarious academics, Radical theorists of post fordism have ignored what Bologna calls the multitude of globalization. That is, all of those who work across the supply chain in the manual and intellectual labor that makes highly complex, integrated transnational systems of warehousing, transport, and control possible. In what he calls the second geography of logistical spaces, we also encounter for him the greatest criticality of the system. Though not, as in the proclamations of the coming insurrection and the isolated and ephemeral acts of sabotage, <coughs> but in a section of the working class which retains the residual power of interrupting the productive cycle. A power that offshoring, outsourcing, and downsizing can, as in many, and sometimes almost all respects, stripped from the majority of productive workers themselves. I want to move to um, my uh, third section. Now, I've mentioned, uh, entitled, Refunctioning the Spaces of Capital. I've mentioned uh, uh, Mumford's um, argument that in a sense one of the most significant dimensions of contemporary metropolitan transformations in the electrical grid, the electrical network. And indeed, it is electrical networks which are also mentioned in the quote from uh, uh, the coming insurrection, which I discussed before. The electrical grid provides me the sense of the kind of uh, transition to this concluding uh, uh, section, where I'd like to touch on the possibilities of thinking of the relationship between the logistics of capital and the spatial politics of anti-capitalism 
in a way that does not merely involve the bare negation or mere sabotage of the former by the latter. The power grid, which Mumford contrasts with the railway network, was in fact a system whose capabilities for coordinated decentralization was emphasized as a necessary model for a transition out of an aimlessly urbanizing capital. Intriguingly, in the city of history, in fact, Mumford puts this understanding of the power grid directly in uh, a dialogue with uh, Kropotkin's uh, arguments about decentralization in fields, factories, and workshops. Following Mumford, a number of uh, mainly Marxist theorists, um, though also ones with considerable anarchist sympathies like Mike Davis, uh, have of late reflected in a mode that, to borrow a quip from Harvey, we could call pre-communist rather than postmodern, on what aspects of contemporary capitalism could be refunctioned in the passage to a communist or post-capitalist society. <coughs> Adversely to the coming insurrection, they have asked how could a high-speed rail system or an electrical network be rendered not useless but at least minimally useful, and what would clearly need to be a thoroughly redefined conception of use, one not mediated and dominated by the abstract compulsions of value and exchange. It is striking that many of these authors, uh, and again, I think this is a kind of historically or conjuncturally determinate character of this, have put logistical questions at the forefront of these kind of thought experiments, semi-utopian thought experiments. Almost as though logistics were capitalism's pharmacon, both the cause for its pathologies, from the damaging hypertrophy of long-distance transport of commodities, the aimless sprawl, and the potential domain of anti-capitalist solutions. Thus, for instance, in his uh, Valence to the Dialectic, Frederick Jameson has um, somewhat perversely identified the distribution systems of Walmart, the very emblem of capitalism's seemingly inexhaustible capacity for devastating mediocrity, <laughs> as precisely one of those aspects of capitalism whose dialectical refunctioning, or whose change of valence could give a determinate character and use to social utopias. The ambivalence of logistics, and particularly of the environmental consequences of these unprecedented logistical and energetic complexes um, that drive contemporary metropolises or megalopolises, um, has um, led, uh, amongst other things, Mike Davis in his appropriately titled Who Will Build the Ark? To demand that, recalling the great experiments in urbanism of the USSR in the 1920s, early 1920s, we begin to look for the potentialities for a non-capitalist and non-catastrophic future in cities themselves. In fact, I was actually present when uh, a number of Greek anarchists were interviewing uh, Mike Davis and were very disturbed when they were talking about the you know, possibilities of sort of decentralized rural living that he said is the only thing that he praised about Stalin was so giant systems of workers' housing, which led to his our conversation for the In particular, Davis has advanced to borrow from uh, Tim, uh, uh, has borrowed uh, some of the, sorry, in particular, Davis has advanced some of the parameters of what he calls a low carbon democratic socialism by arguing that, contrary to the Malthusianism of much of the Green Movement, it is, as he puts it, the priority given to public affluence over private wealth that can set the standard for a conversion of engines of doom into what he calls resources of hope. Most contemporary cities, writes Davis, repress the potential environmental efficiencies inherent in human settlement <coughs> density. The ecological genius of the city remains a vast, largely hidden power. But there is no planetary shortage of carrying capacity if we are willing to make democratic public space, rather than modular private consumption, <coughs> the engine of sustainable equality. One could argue that this assertion of the necessity of a drastic transition, as against plural but ineffectual interruptions, takes logistic and energetic questions of anti-capitalist struggle much more seriously than the convergence of an anti-urbanist vision of space and kind of epiphanic models of revolt, which, for evident historical and indeed legitimate historical and political reasons, has come to dominate much capitalist thought, anti-capitalist thought, possibly capitalist thought as well, um, anarchist or otherwise. It also does this by recognizing what, by analogy with Marcuse, Marcuse's eros and civilization, we could call the necessary, as opposed to surplus alienation, involved in complex social systems, including post-capitalist ones. As Harvey himself has soberly noted, against the grain of fantasies of kind of tabula rasa, unmediated communism or anarchism, I quote, the proper management of constituted environments may therefore require transitional political institutions, hierarchies of power relations, and systems of governance that could well be anathema to both ecologists and socialists alike. This is because, in a fundamental sense, there is nothing unnatural about New York City. I'll leave this for locals. 
And sustaining such an ecosystem, even in transition, entails an inevitable compromise with the forms of social organization and social relations which produced it. End of quote. Here again, the question of what use can be drawn from the 